The China Global South podcast is supported in part by the Africa China Reporting Project at Wits University in Johannesburg, and by our subscribers. Thank you. If you'd like to subscribe for daily news and exclusive analysis about every aspect of China's engagement in Africa, Asia, and throughout the developing world, go to chinaglobalsouth.com/forward/slash/subscribe. Hello and welcome to another edition of the China Global South podcast, a proud member of the Seneca Podcast Network. I'm Eric Olander. Today, coming to you from Washington D.C., and as always, I'm joined by China Global South's managing editor, Kobus van Staden, in Johannesburg, South Africa. A very good afternoon to you, Kobus. Good afternoon, Kobus. While a lot of attention now is focused on the dramatic events that have been unfolding in Russia over the weekend, I want to really make sure that everybody keeps their focus on also what's happening in the South China Sea and in the. East China Sea, where there is just a remarkable amount of military hardware from around the world. Let me just bring you up to date on just what's happened in the past few days. This is just the past few days. The USS Ronald Reagan, one of America's largest aircraft carriers, arrived in the central Vietnamese port of Da Nang. Now, this is really remarkable because U.S. ships don't dock very often in Vietnam. In fact, this is only the third time. Since the end of the war in 1975, that a U.S. aircraft carrier has docked in Vietnam, and it's fascinating because the arrival of the Ronald Reagan coincides with the Vietnamese Prime Minister's visit to China at the same time. One has to think that those two events are not a coincidence; that the Vietnamese structured it that way, where they go with a big smile, a big handshake, but they also say. Look, we've got some very powerful friends over on that side too. Now, speaking of the Vietnamese, last week Vietnamese defense minister was in India and received a donation of two navy vessels from the Indian Navy as well. That's going to be used to bolster、uh, Vietnam's maritime defenses. Also, the French frigate NS Lorraine arrived in Manila, and the first ever ASEAN naval exercises that were originally scheduled to take place in the South China Sea in September. Well, they've been moved out of that region to now the Straits of Malacca. Again, probably because it's just a little too provocative for many ASEAN member states who have territorial claims in the South China Sea. So, Kobus, it is a very active theater of operation right now. And again, it's one of those stories that has been going on for a long time. So people may not be paying as much attention to it, especially with the dramatic events. That have unfolded in Russia, but it is very, very important. Absolutely, and because it's been fraught for such a long time, it's sometimes hard to appreciate how fraught it is right now. You know, because obviously these disputes have gone on for a long time. The issues around a possible South China Sea code of conduct has been dragging for years and years and years. But at the same time, we are at a moment, I think, now where it really is quite tense. You know, and and where there's there's so many different militaries moving through such a narrow space that the potential for unintended issues. You know, is is higher, I think, than usual. Well, we've seen what that tension actually looks like in some dramatic videos that have surfaced over the past several months of confrontations between the Philippine Coast Guard and the Chinese Coast Guard using lasers. Also, there have been instances between the United States and China where fighter jets are passing in front of U.S. EP3 spy planes, and also ships at sea with the Canadians, the Americans, and the Chinese have had some close interactions with one another. So, dramatic videos there, and that really brings again to the tension to what's happening here. And so, we thought it would be a good idea for us to step back a little bit. Let's explore this issue, dive into it a little bit more to give you an up-to-the-minute understanding of what's happening. And so, for that, we thought it would be great for us to reach out to Ray Powell, who is the lead for Project Miyoshu at the Gordian Knot Center for National Security Innovation at Stanford University. Ray follows what's going on in the South China Sea from a distinctly U.S. national security perspective. So that's really important to know. When you're listening to his comments, prior to joining the team at Stanford, Ray spent more than 20 years in the U.S. Air Force, and later as an attaché to U.S. embassies in Vietnam, Australia, and Afghanistan. And he also served as the host nation coordinator in Qatar. You'll hear in our discussion how he integrates a lot of that experience into his analysis of the current situation that's now unfolding 
in the South China Sea. Let's listen to our discussion now with Ray Powell about the tensions that are brewing in the South China Sea. Ray Powell, thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We really appreciate it. Uh, Thanks, Eric. It's really a pleasure to be with you. Well, it's been a very busy past few weeks. The United States aircraft carrier USS Ronald Reagan is now in the South China Sea. The Philippines, Japan, and the U.S. are all announced that they're conducting joint exercises in the region. Germany earlier this month announced that it's planning to send two warships to the region next year. Both the Australians and the Canadian navies are also active in the South China Sea, not to mention all of the different claimants in the region who have their navies obviously doing operations and trying to do their best to protect the boundaries that they claim are theirs. So with all of that in mind, let's start with a bit of background as to why so many countries, both in the region and from afar, see that they have a vested interest in what happens in the South China Sea. What are the origins of this dispute? Yeah, so that's really interesting. China's claim to the South China Sea can be traced back to the 1930s, back when it was the Republic of China, and a cartographer was asked to draw a map of China's boundaries and included in his map essentially the entire South China Sea going all the way down to James Shoal, which he was not aware, I don't think at the time, is entirely underwater all the time. But that lies within what is now Indonesia's exclusive economic zone. So he drew this map and that over time morphed into China's current claim of the Nine Dash Line, which essentially is this almost the exact same territory or maritime territory, shall we say, over which it claims sovereignty oftentimes referenced as indisputable sovereignty. And nobody took this too seriously for quite a long time until it began to appear in international documents, you know, submissions to the UN saying that you know China's nine dash line is in fact its claim. And things began to get serious then. This also sort of intersects with various specific island feature claims in the South China Sea which all of these different nations have had over the years. And for a long time, what we thought was, well, we just need to sort of keep everybody static so that nobody tries to do new things with these island features. But of course, that was sort of broken in about 10 years ago as China began to build out several of its features into very large military bases far off the scale from anything we'd seen before. So The real change since then has been China's much more aggressive patrolling and assertions within sort of pushing out to the edges of the Nine Dash Line, which goes deep into the UN authorized exclusive economic zones of its neighbors. So before where we were focused mostly on features, now we're looking very seriously at how these claims transgress the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, which the United States, although it is not a signatory to that agreement, has abided by really since the 80s and even asserts. So again, a very long way of getting around to the fact that this has become a question of what is the U.S. commitment to asserting international law as commonly understood and that as a proxy for the U.S.-led global order. So in relation to that, can you also talk us through the other claimants to parts of the South China Sea? Like who are the other states that also claim like sections of that sea as their own? Right. So traditionally, we've always talked about the claimants as being China and Taiwan, of course, which also essentially echoes China's claims, the Philippines and Vietnam, Malaysia and Brunei. But we should, and Indonesia has never included itself as a, quote, claimant because it doesn't claim features within sort of the the Spratly Island group. However, because the Nine Dash Line has become at issue, Indonesia does have a maritime dispute with China in the South China Sea. So you can go ahead and add Indonesia to that list. So you've been following on your Twitter feed, and by the way, it's an absolutely fascinating Twitter feed where you put up all these graphics showing the various maritime vessels. Some are Chinese Coast Guard ships, some are PLA ships, and some are the maritime militia. These are, I guess, they're fishing vessels, if you will, that act in many ways as part of an extension of the Chinese maritime force. And 
oftentimes they're crossing into what you just referenced, the exclusive economic zone. If we can just get some, again, a couple terms out of the way before we get deeper into the discussion. When we have an actual boundary, a border that extends into the ocean, how is that different than the exclusive economic zone? Sure. So each country's claim may or may not conform to the internationally recognized exclusive economic zone. So in 1982, an agreement was concluded called the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. And this took decades to actually conclude. And everything was not immediately agreed to by every country. Kind of strangely, China did eventually agree to UNCLOS, as we call it. And the United States never succeeded in getting UNCLOS through Senate ratification. So we have this very strange circumstance in which the United States never signed UNCLOS, but abides by it and asserts it. And China did sign UNCLOS, and certainly in the the case of the South China Sea, does not abide by it. And what was the U.S. objection to it? What did the Senate not like about UNCLOS, that it did not want to sign up for it? Sure. It actually started with the Reagan administration itself had concerns about the enforcement mechanisms for deep seabed mining and how those might infringe on certain U.S. interests. Those were mostly worked out, but the Senate balked initially on the same merits. And there's just never existed enough energy in the U.S. legislative process to push this thing all the way through. So we don't really know how it would be resolved today because the U.S. has never really come up against a circumstance where UNCLOS kept us from doing something or enabled us to do something. We never really just resolved that. Now, of course, those of us who are national security practitioners really wish we would because it it sort of makes us look a little silly on the international stage, but it's just never sort of made it all the way through the entire ratification process. So as Eric mentioned at the top, you know, the USS Ronald Reagan is currently in in that area and many other countries have vessels passing through and are planning kind of naval exercises there and so on. So how do these, you know, kind of countries that aren't located in that neighborhood, but still kind of feel that they have to exercise a claim there, what what is the kind of legal grounds for their activity in, in that region? Are there areas where they can go and areas where they can't? Or like, how has that worked out? Well, so it depends on who you ask. Under international law, any country can send their navy through the South China Sea. It is considered international waters, so there's no real restriction on anyone just sending their navy to do exercises there or anything else. The difficulty comes into when China tries to assert what they call historic rights to the South China Sea. So, for example, we just had this story break a couple of days ago where New Zealand back in 2018 sent a ship into the South China Sea and it was challenged repeatedly by Chinese ships demanding to know where it was going and, and why it was transgressing into China's sovereign waters, et cetera, et cetera. So these things happen actually quite regularly. When a foreign warship does come into the South China Sea, China will exert its influence, maybe monitor the ship, shadow the ship let the ship know repeatedly that these are China's claimed waters. But international law gives every country the right to be in those waters. It gets a little trickier when you talk about going into a territorial sea, which is 12 nautical miles out from every country's coastline. There, if you're going through a territorial sea, you need to go essentially in a straight line. We call that innocent passage. You're not supposed to do maneuvers in a territorial sea. Within an exclusive economic zone, which is 200 nautical miles out from a country's coastline, you can do pretty much whatever you want as long as it's not taking the resources without permission from that country. So for example, you're not supposed to fish in another country's waters without permission from the country. You're not supposed to exploit hydrocarbons, oil and gas, without that country's permission. That country has first rights on those resources. I remember a couple of years ago, Israeli Prime Minister Ariel Sharon, he described Israeli occupation of Palestinian territories as facts on the ground. And it was just an immovable reality that the Israelis had now expanded their territory. And a lot of analysts started to look at that in the context of the South China Sea as well. That is, over the past 10 years, the Chinese have steadily been increasing their presence in the South China Sea. As you pointed out, they've taken these, basically these atolls, and turned them into full-fledged islands that have then been converted into military bases that are now weaponized. And the Chinese in that time have become the largest navy in the world. 
potentially quite formidable. We don't know how they will perform in combat because we just haven't seen it, but it is a formidable Navy now. They've got the gray forces, the maritime militias that are there. And the fact is that the Chinese in this part of the world are exceedingly strong, and their goal is to become a regional hegemon. And I guess I wonder whether the United States really can change the facts on the ground in this day and age. Is it even possible, or is this an exercise in vanity, that the historical momentum is on China's side, given the strength that they have in their own neighborhood? How do you respond to something like that? Yeah, Eric, I think that's well put. I think that they have indeed changed the facts on the ground. And these island bases have really turned into very crucial platforms from which to project power using not just Navy ships, as you mentioned, but Coast Guard ships, which they use in very different ways than we think of Coast Guard ships. We think of Coast Guard ships as what we're going to you know, rescue mariners who are in trouble. We're going to enforce certain laws within our, our own uh, waters, but they use them as power projection. And many of these Coast Guard ships have weapons and some of them are extremely large. And so they will forward base these Coast Guard ships and this extremely large paramilitary force we refer to as the maritime militia out of these island bases so that they can more easily remain in these areas of the South China Sea, and they don't have to recover all the way back to China's coast or to Hainan Island every time they need to refit or refuel or those kinds of things. So that allows them to essentially be the local constabulary, if you will, for most of the South China Sea. So if you're a Filipino fisherman or an oil and gas company in Malaysia, you will constantly be confronted by maritime militia and coast guard ships within your country's own exclusive economic zone. And so you have to sort of deal with that on a daily basis. Whereas, of course, as you mentioned, other countries may come through, including the United States, may come through with large naval groups, but they will come and they will go and China will always be there. So this really has become a very long term challenge for not just the United States, but its partners and allies and those who are committed to the preservation and restoration of what we tend to refer to as the rules-based order that governs how countries interact in the maritime space. So, you know, through the years that I've been reading about this issue, there's been recurrent references to the South China Sea Code of Conduct that never seems to get done. It's, it's always in draft form. I think it's supposed to be in second draft form this year. So I was wondering kind of if you could tell us a little bit more about this code of conduct process, who's involved and why is it taking so long? So the code of conduct is essentially the, the participants are the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, what we call ASEAN, which you know is essentially all of Southeast Asia working together on a consensus basis, and China. Uh, so they are the participants in the process. Of course, not all ASEAN nations have a direct stake in the South China Sea. So Laos, for example, is a landlocked nation, has no navy, and, and so is not deeply invested. And some countries without a direct interest, such as Cambodia, oftentimes will side more with China because it simply does not want this to become something that is an irritant between itself and a very important influential partner as Cambodia has drawn much closer to Beijing. So this complicates the resolution of these very, very difficult issues. And where it comes down to is in the end, the maritime states of Southeast Asia along the South China Sea have fundamental disagreements with China, which are not easily resolved in a code of conduct. And many of them believe that what China is trying to do is ratify a relatively weak, unenforceable code of conduct and then use that rhetorically to say the UN Convention of the Law of the Sea no longer applies in the South China Sea because we have this code of conduct and this is now essentially the law of the sea. And if they can get that across the line in a state in which it's basically weak and unenforceable, then they have won an important rhetorical point and they can take important unclossed terms and sort of rhetorically retire them and say, those don't apply here. It's just so ironic because in so many other ways, the Chinese talk about the United Nations system as really the Bible for multilateralism around the world. And they will turn to the UN system constantly to bash U.S. unilateral actions and say the UN system and UN 
measures should be the guidepost that everybody follows. And yet, they're highly selective on their application of UN law when it comes to interests that conflict with their own, as we're seeing with UNCLOS. But it comes back to this question of the United States. And the fact is, does the United States really have any credibility in this point to challenge the Chinese because they're not signatories to this? And oftentimes, Chinese propaganda will come up over and over again and bring up this salient point that the United States just isn't relevant here because it's not a signatory. How much does that actually get in the way of settling this, given the fact that the U.S., for whatever reason, refuses to join UNCLOS? Yeah. So, I mean, I think it probably is an irritant more than an obstacle because of the way that the United States over the years has abided by UNCLOS and even asserted UNCLOS even while not having signed it. And the other thing, of course, is so many of these other countries that we're talking about are deeply invested in UNCLOS and would rather not bring up the fact of the U.S. failing to sign it just because they really want to be able to use UNCLOS in their corner, if you will. The most obvious example of this, of course, is the Philippines, which brought a case before an arbitral tribunal in 2013 based on UNCLOS and asked this international court to rule on whether or not China was correct in claiming the nine dash line, particularly as it affected the Philippines, or whether the Philippine claims to its own exclusive economic zone were correct. And the arbitral tribunal, based on UNCLOS, ruled overwhelmingly in the Philippines' favor. So the Philippines is probably the starkest example of a country that obviously would like the United States to sign UNCLOS tomorrow, as would many people here in the United States, but you know is not really interested in over-worrying that matter because the more immediate matter is how the United States acts rather than whether it signs the document. But that ruling is really important because it really shows at the end of the day, this is about raw power. And the fact is that China has more power than the Philippines do. So they just ignored the UNCLOS ruling. They just passed by it and they said it's not relevant. And so at the end of the day, all of this talk about international order, about laws of the sea, about borders and all of that, it doesn't matter because the Chinese have bigger sticks than anybody else in that region and they're using them. So it just seems to me, again, this is just my outside amateur observation, that they have created realities now that everybody must abide by because they're stronger than everybody else. It's the nature of power. Yeah, I think that's well said. And it really does come down to why our particular project here at Stanford at the Gordian Knot Center, we decided to focus in on the information space as being the most productive place for us to use our efforts to address the South China Sea challenge, because there's not really a near-term military or diplomatic solution that's obvious to us. So what we came up with was what needs to happen is China needs to have its rhetorical case undermined based on China's own actions. And People already do this to a degree, but what we thought was it needs to sort of be out there daily, the ways in which China ignores international laws that applies to the South China Sea and overwhelms its neighbors with force, and that China needs to pay a constant reputational cost so that when it comes to conferences, when it comes into the international space and claims that it's looking for win-win solutions, that we can have this constant reminder that in the South China Sea, In the end, it really is win-lose, and China intends to win as its neighbors lose. So, you know, relating to ASEAN specifically, we recently saw the announcement of plans for the ASEAN group to do their own naval exercises in the South China Sea. And recently, there's been some doubts raised about that and some kind of divisions happening within ASEAN around this issue. So I was wondering kind of if you could talk a little bit about the role of ASEAN and what the status of these planned roles are. Sure. ASEAN and Indonesia as the sort of self-identified leader, if you will, or at least, you know, they feel like they are the leader of ASEAN and wants to be able to say, look, we are capable of collective action. And they did not advance an aggressive plan to have, you know, a war game, as it were. This was cast very much in the mold of, well, this is search and rescue and humanitarian operations. So let's all get together and say we can all do this. But China has 
consistently tried to undermine collective action. There seems to be almost nothing that China likes less than countries operating in concert within the South China Sea. So it exerts its influence in subtle ways, often through proxy. So Cambodia specifically came out objecting to or saying that they would not participate in the ASEAN exercise. And those of us who sort of watched this closely strongly suspect that there has been pressure placed on Cambodia by China that they should not be involved in this because this undermines China's strategy to sort of divide and conquer. And China always tries to deal with countries on a bilateral basis, especially if those are smaller countries. So China will always veer in the direction of bilateral talks, bilateral discussions, bilateral agreements, because it knows it carries a much greater advantage in those circumstances. Interesting. When we look at the different claimants, members of ASEAN, I live in Vietnam, and I can tell you there is no more passionate issue for the Vietnamese than the territorial integrity of their claims to the islands in the South China Sea, or what they call the East Vietnam Sea. The Philippines doesn't call it the South China Sea, they call it the West Philippine Sea. So again, everyone has different names. It is so sensitive. I mean, you can't overstate how what a potent issue this is. So I'm just wondering when the Vietnamese participate in an ASEAN forum like this to do military exercises or the code of conduct, do you really feel that they have an ability to, again, change the equation? Or is this just trying to play a weak hand as best as they can? Yeah, I think it's kind of a combination of those two things. You know, they do obviously have a weaker hand than when it comes to China and its military and paramilitary strength. But again, they do recognize that collective action is an advantage for them if they can leverage it. You mentioned living in Vietnam. I lived there for three years in Hanoi when I worked at the U.S. Embassy. And I was there in 2014 when there was a dispute over an oil rig that China put down in a disputed area off the coast of Vietnam. And that was the most serious public protest I ever experienced that has happened in Vietnam in recent memory. And the government of Vietnam, of course, is a you know communist party, single party state kind of affair, and they're very uncomfortable with public protests. But for a little while, they tried to sort of accommodate them and even sort of direct them in certain ways until they just kind of got out of control. But it showed how deep the passions run. Even though it is a communist party state, there are very, very deep feelings in Vietnam about the Vietnam's rights in, as you say, at the East Sea. So this is one of those things that can stir passions. And it's one of the reasons why even when we put out information about Chinese incursions into the East Sea or Vietnam's exclusive economic zone, there's a hesitancy, there's a reticence on the part of the government in Hanoi to comment on it, to allow state-controlled media outlets to put it out there in their own terms. So usually these things get picked up on international media and eventually in state media. I have a funny story about that oil rig. I was talking to one of former Secretary of State John Kerry's uh, staffers who told me the story of when, and this John Kerry was the Secretary of State when this all went down in 2014 during the Obama administration. And uh, he was recounting that a Chinese foreign minister, Wang Yi, who was then the foreign minister, was resolute with Kerry and said, we will not move the oil rig one inch. And that was the line that we will not move it one inch. And Kerry apparently told Wang, he said, listen, whatever you do, don't move that oil rig. That oil rig has been the best thing for us that we've had in a long time because it really crystallized for everybody what China was doing. And literally within a week, the oil rig was gone. Once the Chinese had recognized that it was actually hurting them and that it was rallying other Southeast Asian countries around to the United States and for the need for strong U.S. action in the South China Sea, then they came back. So Kerry was saying, hey, listen. Just keep the oil rig. It's working for us just where we want it. So, uh. so so I'll also share an amusing personal story about the oil rig. I decided on a particular day to go down to the area outside the Chinese embassy to see what the protests were doing that particular day. But as I'd already made the decision to go down there, I got a series of text messages on my phone, which had gone out to every mobile phone in the country. And they were all from the prime minister, essentially saying that the protests were over. And so I got to the place where the protests usually gathered, and there's a place across from the Chinese embassy called Lenin Park or Lenin Square 
Uh, and usually it was wide open and there was a statue of Vladimir Lenin there, obviously something of a relic and people would have their kids there playing and people would sell things. But on the, on this particular day, of course, during the protest days, they barricaded it off and there were security people everywhere. There were traffic police, there were public security, there were people with armbands, there were plainclothes police and anyone who got together, they just sort of break them up. And so I went up to Lenin Park and there was a kind of a little entrance there through the barricades, and there was one of these gentlemen sitting there with the armband, and I asked, using my broken Vietnamese, if I could go in, and of course he said no, and I said, well, why? And he said, well, and he had to think about that, and he said, safety, and I said, well, safety for who? And he said, for foreigners. And I said, well, I feel very safe here. And of course, at this point, I'm just being a smart aleck, right? I'm, and I left him alone after that. I felt kind of bad for picking on him. But it was just sort of this strange little uh, place where you know nobody could go into Lennon Park because... That's where the protests were, and that, that this was the day they decided they would end, and they did. I was there that time. We all got that text message that you got, which said, stay off the streets, and there was a lot of anxiety because, as you pointed out, the emotions ran really high, and the concern was that if people didn't listen to the prime minister, then there was going to be real problems. So again, this controlling of the tap of emotions is something that's very difficult to do in societies like this. Like in Saigon, where I was at the time, there were police and other police, you know, undercover people on every block just to really send the message to say the protests are over. So very interesting times there. Well, in relation to this issue of their high passions, you know, this is something I one obviously picks up, you know, not having lived in, in, in the areas I haven't. So you pick up these kind of like strong territorial issues and the related kind of popular resentment around it. But then at the same time, you know, as, as we cover this region on a daily basis, the, the amount of economic integration between China and ASEAN states is really off the charts. As we speak, even as Vietnam is deeply resenting Chinese, you know, pressure around territory, at the moment, China is essentially keeping Vietnam's lights on. You know, they, they, there's cross-border electricity sales. There's, there's hundreds of stories on a daily basis of different kind of trade deals, investment deals, you know, logistics corridors and so on. So how heavy do these territorial issues actually weigh in the fullness of the relationship? Do the economic ties between China and ASEAN completely outweigh these territorial issues? Or how are they kind of compartmentalized? You know, how do they live next to each other? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. You're right that the economic issues are front and center, and also that China uses economic leverage very frequently, although how effectively is sort of case by case. So I think as a general matter, it uses it constantly and effectively, and many of these countries pull their punches, as it were, on the South China Sea issues based on how much they think that these economic threats will directly impact them. But China also overplays that hand from time to time. And I was defense attache in Australia at a time when China was attempting to leverage certain Australian exports to get Australia to back off of some of its more pro-US. Uh, and actually, so that Australia had passed some counter interference laws that China was very unhappy with, foreign interference. China was very unhappy with and was attempting to use this economic leverage. And what Australia discovered in the process of that is that there were global markets for a lot of its products. And so even if China turned off the trade spigot for certain things, they could find other markets. And China still wanted those things. So China would go and buy its products from other places. And so the global market would simply adapt. And the immediate threat was less than they feared. And so through that entire process, China lost a lot of its economic leverage because Australia simply learned it had other options. And so I think that China is, you know, perhaps a little more reticent, you know, to use this leverage in specific ways and rather would prefer just kind of hold it out as a generalized threat that you don't want to complicate this very complex and important relationship with protests over this or that incident in the South China Sea. But we think that that works against these smaller nations over time because the extent to which they are quiet about the things that happen to them at the hands of this large Chinese military and paramilitary force in the South China Sea, if they are quiet about that, then China uses that to sort of slowly exert its influence and increase its control. And so we think over the long term, it's better for those countries if these are surfaced at the time that they happen so that they can build some national resilience against those activities. 
Okay, let's wrap up our conversation trying to look forward a little bit. Every few weeks now on the news, one of the things that we're starting to see are these, what the Americans call very close encounters, unsafe maneuvers. The Chinese disagree in their assessment of it, but we saw it. Uh, some video shot from a Canadian warship a couple of weeks ago of a Chinese frigate or some vessel crossing in front of the bow. We saw also a Chinese fighter jet, you know, just crossing right in front and the aerial blast from the exhaust really jettisoning the American plane. And it really brings up this question of when you have so many different navies and militaries and air force that are in that vicinity, the risk of accidental encounters goes up considerably. We have already had some experience with this when I think it was one of the first days that George W. Bush was in office, an American EP-3 spy plane was brought down onto Hainan. Today, the tensions are vastly higher. So if there is an accident, it could potentially lead to more kinetic activity that would then lead to something that we don't even want to imagine. Do you sleep well at night, given the fact that you think about these issues all the time and you see so much military hardware so much aggressiveness, a lot of contact now between the various militaries. What are we to think of all of this? Well, I think the other thing to pull into this discussion is the current state of affairs where China is refusing to have military to military discussions, even when the two defense ministers are in the same, you know, the defense secretary in the, are in the same place at the same time, such as they were early this month in Singapore at the Shangri-La Dialogue. And what we are learning, I think, is the extent to which China sees risk escalation as something that we want to avoid more than they do. So they see that as a bargaining chip. We see this dialogue as something that everybody should want so that what you're talking about does not happen. If there is some kind of incident that we need to make sure that we're, we dialogue through so that it doesn't escalate. So we think that that's sort of an unmitigated good and everyone should want that. They see this issue of the military to military dialogue as a bargaining chip. And so their most immediate friction point for them is that their current defense minister, Li Shangfu, is under U.S. sanction from years ago when the China bought some things from Russia and fell afoul of a sanctions regime that we call CATSA or the Countering America's Adversaries Through Sanctions Act. And of course, he wasn't the defense minister at the time, but he was sanctioned under CATSA and has brought that sanction with him into this new role as defense minister. And China would like that lifted, and they want that lifted before any military to military dialogue happens. We look at that situation and say, no, let's let's separate these two issues because the military to military dialogue is a risk mitigation issue that we should resolve to everybody's benefit, but that's not the way they see it. So there is sort of a risk tolerance that they see them having a greater risk tolerance than we do, and they can use that to their advantage. So that worries me. That worries me that there could be one of these incidents, and because all of these normal channels of communication, things that we used to have with the Soviets back during the Cold War, these are not currently operating. And those really need to operate for those events like the EP3 downing in 2001 that you talked about. So your Twitter feed is really fascinating and, and, and you include a lot of a lot of aerial kind of imagery tracking the routes of different ships and a lot of very granular kind of information about how these different ships are moving through this region. So I was wondering how you do your work and how you actually keep track of all of these movements. Yeah, so ships in the commercial and you know, sort of the non-military space are supposed to always be broadcasting, so ships of a certain size are always supposed to be broadcasting on a system we call the automatic information system. And it's really a safety of navigation system so that ships don't come into, you know, basically don't collide with one another in crowded sea lanes. So because ships, including fishing ships, and China treats its maritime militia, it calls them fishing ships, even though most of them don't fish at all, and, and some of them fish very little, because their primary purpose is to assert sovereignty. So they're supposed to always have these systems turned on, as do their Coast Guard. And so that enables us to kind of keep an eye on what they're doing. And we can see when they are exerting power in certain ways, whether it be by swarming, whether it be sort of this survey in force that they did in the month of May in Vietnam's exclusive economic zone, whether it be challenging uh, legitimate operations within a country's own waters, 
those kinds of things, we can often see those things. Now, ships that are up to no good will often turn those things off and on or pretend to be something else or pretend to be somewhere else. But we can also keep track of that. So if suddenly a Coast Guard ship turns into a small pleasure boat, well, we saw that. And we know what you are and that whatever you're doing, you're probably not up to any good. But of course, Chinese ships will will turn them off for a particular period of time, but then turn them on when they want to be seen. So, for example, we've watched the world's largest Coast Guard ship, which has recently been in Vietnam's exclusive economic zone among its oil and gas operations a couple of times. And it specifically turned its AIS system on, its transmissions on, when it was touring through those areas because... China wanted the government of Vietnam to know that this very, very large Coast Guard ship was there. It was sending a message. What we do is we say, okay, if you're going to send a message directly to the government of Vietnam, you know, because of course the government controls the information that comes in, we're also going to tell the world. So if you want to intimidate the Vietnamese government, that's up to you, but we're going to make sure everybody else knows about it and we're going to put it out as well. And you said recently in a news report that China wants to normalize these types of incursions to the point where Vietnam no longer even reacts or protests to it. It's become so every day. Yes. And as we talked about, China wants to be able to deal with Vietnam bilaterally on the basis of power. And so if Vietnam is consistently quiet about these things, ultimately Vietnam plays into China's hands. So again, we believe that this public exposure is something we can do to undermine China's rhetoric, at least as being sort of this win-win, good neighbor, you know, just deal with us and everything will be fine for you. Rather, we see them operating more like sort of the local mafia, which says it would be a shame if something happened that were to disturb the peace that you enjoy under my oversight. Okay. Ray Powell is the lead for Project Miyoshu at the Gordian Knott Center for National Security Innovation at Stanford University. Ray, thank you so much for taking the time to join us and to walk us through the work that you're doing. If people want to follow this Twitter feed, as Koba said, it is absolutely fascinating to see the graphics that you're putting up and tracking these incursions. Where can they find that? So my Twitter handle is at Gordian Knott Ray. That's how you can find me. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much again. We'll put a link to that in the show notes so everybody can find it. Ray, we really appreciate your time today. It's been really a pleasure talking to both of you. Thanks so much. Kobus, the most interesting part of the discussion with Ray for me was this aspect of the information warfare part of it. Ray is decidedly out there to try and counter Chinese information on their activities in the South China Sea. He has a lot of detractors on the Chinese side. In fact, there are rival organizations that are set up to try and counter the work that he's doing. But this is very, very interesting to look at, and not only in terms of geopolitics, maritime security, but also information warfare. Absolutely. And it's it's also very interesting for me just personally, because I, I've been for a long time been very interested in the use of media and the construction of national identity. So this is just <laughs> this is a smorgasbord of, of that, you know, kind of both both on the Chinese side and the ASEAN side. And one of the data points that we picked up recently was that the Philippines is now running tourist boating tours past different parts of the Spratly Islands, and it's all framed as kind of this freedom cruise, you know, as part of kind of like demonstrating Philippine national identity. But it's also obviously a tourism business, and, and apparently it's about $2,000 a pop for tourists who want to go on their tours. So, so it's, it's just a, a really interesting kind of example of how all of these different countries just all have their different ways of constructing national identity through media, and China being number one, of course. We talked about the South China Sea today. Uh, Unfortunately, we didn't have time to talk about some of the other disputes that are in the region. There's the East China Sea, and that is involving the Japanese over the Diaoyu Islands, or what the Japanese call the Senkaku Islands as well. So the South China Sea is not the only place where there are these disputes. One of the things that I think surprises people who are outside of this region, who may not be following this topic, is that, number one, World War II is still not settled. That is something that is absolutely shocking to people, that a lot of these disputes over territory and maritime claims, particularly in the East China Sea, date back to the Second World War. Secondly, the passion that people have, as we talked about, cannot be overstated, whether it's in Japan, Korea, China, Southeast Asia. These issues are so passionate. But the last point that I want to make 
is while everybody is focusing on Ukraine, understandably, be given the horrors of that war, the fact is, is that Ukraine remains at this point a regional war in its current format. Yes, the United States and Europe are pumping weapons in, but it is contained into a regional war. Should the South China Sea turn hot, this becomes an uncontainable international conflict on a scale that we haven't seen probably since the Second World War, given the powers that are involved. Think about it. China, Japan, the United States, Australia. These are very big powers. Then you've got the Vietnamese, the Philippines, and so many countries are in this thing. It turns from like, oh my God, to holy crap, really fast. And that's what keeps me up at night thinking about like if there's an accident or if one of the claimants pushes too hard in one direction that forces a reaction from the other side, the ability to stop a conflict, I wonder, is going to be exceedingly difficult, especially because as Ray pointed out, there are not the red phones that we had in the Cold War, where the leaders from both sides were able to pick it up and say, you know, we got to cool this down. Those channels of communications are not open right now between the U.S. and China. So there's a lot of reason to be very worried over what we're seeing in the South China Sea. And if you're not paying attention to the South China Sea, you really, really need to be focusing on what's going on there. Absolutely. And I mean, at the same time, the South China Sea also has some of the world's busiest shipping lanes. And it's a region with several of the world's largest economies. So, you know, the, the economic ramifications of any kind of problems in the South China Sea, you know, is even larger than the military implications of it. So it's really quite something. And it's also being a rationale now for a major arms buildup. So the Indians just gifted two Corvette ships to the Vietnamese. There's been a massive buying of weapons throughout the region. Submarines are being purchased. We have the ACUS deal, and that is ostensibly meant to protect the sea lanes for Australian, U.S., and U.K. shipping and what they call the rules-based order. Again, I say they call the rules-based order simply because, as we pointed out, the United States itself is very selective on what rules it wants to participate in. I disagree a little bit with Ray in terms of the optics of the U.S. not being part of UNCLOS. I think that really hampers them. It looks really bad because the United States goes around the world constantly telling people about the need to preserve the rules-based order, and yet it's not a signatory to UNCLOS. It's not a signatory to the International Criminal Court. And I don't know. I just think that there are real alignment problems in some of the U.S. rhetoric on these things, and they would be much better positioned if they were you know, signatories to these tribunals and these also to these laws. Yeah, you know, but you know that that's. I think I think no one is hundred percent surprised at, at this state, <laughs> this kind of situation. You know, um, I think you know that has been a feature. I think of U.S. foreign policy for a while, but yeah, no, I agree. You know, kind of in terms of coherence and consistency, it would definitely help. But you know, there's kind of big country politics involved as well. Well, that's it. And by the way, the Chinese are just as complicit in this. So this is kind of why I say the U.S. and the Chinese, they in many ways, you know, are often more alike than they are different, where they get to pick and choose and the big powers get to pick and choose. Right. I mean, that's just the prerogative of power. They can say, I like this. I don't like that. I mean, that's the way it is, I guess. I mean, I don't know. But it means obviously also that the world remains stuck with a state-based system where competition between different states end up trumping everything else, including kind of collective problems like climate change. So the state-based system is a curse for the rest of the world, but it is a boon for the very strong states, which means we will have it for a while. Okay, well, let's leave our conversation there. This is a topic, again, that we focus on almost every day in the China Global South Project newsletter and our coverage that we do. I hope that you'll give it a chance. Go to chinaglobalsouth.com slash subscribe. You can try it out free for 30 days. You can see the great work that Cobus and the team are doing every day to put this newsletter together. We've got editors in Asia, Africa, and the Middle East who are contributing to it. And there's really nothing like it out there. So if you want to follow what China's doing day to day and get analysis and insights and understanding on these issues in more detail, probably than anything from any intelligence service, and I would actually argue that we do a better job than most of the intelligence services do on this, then you're going to want to try it out. Chinaglobalsouth.com slash subscribe. Let's leave the conversation there. Kobus and I will be back again next week with another episode of the China Global South podcast. I'm Eric Olander in New York, and for Kobus van Staden in Johannesburg, thank you so much for listening.
The discussion continues online. Follow the China Global South Project on Twitter at China GS Project and share your thoughts on today's show or head over to our website at ChinaGlobalSouth.com where you can subscribe to receive full access to more than 5,000 articles and podcasts. Once again, that's ChinaGlobalSouth.com. Thank you.